Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we're going to talk about peroxide formation in common reagents and solvents. But before we get into that, I just want to put a disclaimer to say that you should always contact your environment, health, and safety department about what the appropriate protocol is at your institution for handling peroxide forming reagents. This, meant, this video is meant to be educational, not instructive. So if you're going to do this and you haven't contacted your EHS department, or if you don't have another agency which is able to provide input, you're doing this at your own risk. So I have a couple comments just when we start. So the most common one that people know about is the formation of peroxides on ethers because they possess alpha protons. Although there are several other CHs that are able to form peroxides as well as other functional groups. Now I'm not gonna go into too much detail about what types of peroxides can form other than listing possible solvents or reagents that can form them. And so not all of the time when you form peroxides in these reagents will they appear as white solids. Sometimes they'll be present as oils, such as in the case of diethyl ether. It's also important to know that you should test these solvents using a peroxide test kit. Now, if you don't have a test kit available, you can also prepare solutions of iodide to known concentration, and you can essentially titrate the peroxides. Now, most of the time it's more practical to get these peroxide test kits, and if you're not sure whether or not they're still active, you can test if they work using hydrogen peroxide uh, of known concentration. It's worth uh, checking on the peroxide test strips to see what level of peroxides they're able to test. So some of them won't go up to 100 ppm, which would be like where things start kind of getting scary, but you need to know whether or not peroxides can be tested uh, to the levels that you are trying to test for. And so some other comments are such as you don't want to open a bottle just to test for peroxides. If it's a brand new unopened bottle, opening it to let air in is going to like be problematic because you're trying to keep air out in the first place. So if you're trying to see has it formed peroxides yet, but you haven't opened it, you shouldn't open it because it's going to form peroxide. So you only really want to be testing bottles which have already been opened. Um, another useful thing you could do is after you open a bottle that could form peroxides, you can flush it with nitrogen. Now this is more important for stuff that is more prone to form peroxides. Um, you could also use argon if that's available in your lab. So depending on where you're at, the levels of tolerable peroxides may vary. Um, less than 20 ppm is something that's not too concerning most of the time, unless you're concentrating them. And above 100 ppm is like terrifying, so you definitely want to avoid that. Um, now the mechanism for the formation of peroxides in ethers is as follows. Diethyl ether has these alpha protons to the oxygen, which have a weak CH bond. Oxygen in its excited state is able to rip off one of those hydrogens as a radical, forming this hydroperoxy radical. This radi radical can then go and react with another diethyl ether as it's a st more stable radical than this diradical species. And so it will go and do more chemistry. But this diethyl ether radical is able to react with oxygen, whether it's in its excited state or not, it can react. And it will make this peroxy radical, which can abstract a proton from another molecule of ether, finally giving us this diethyl ether hydroperoxide product as well as another equivalent of diethyl ether uh, with a radical that can then go and react with more and more oxygen. Now, you might have seen this drawn out differently, but this is just what occurs statistically based on what's available in solution. Other reactions can happen, radical chemistry does a lot of things, but because this is a bottle of diethyl ether, it's most likely that this is gonna abstract a proton from another ether, rather than abstracting a proton from this hydroperoxide or something else. So this is the most common uh, mechanism that you'd see occur. And you can see that once this starts, we get two equivalents of uh, radicals formed, uh, one in the form here, and then one in the form of this hydroperoxide. And we now have the diethyl ether peroxide as a product. So we form a peroxide and two equivalents of radicals. So this gets worse and worse, the worse it gets, as this kind of has a chain reaction. So one way to prevent this is to use an inhibitor. One inhibitor that's really commonly used is BHT, butylated hydroxytoluene. And what occurs is this radical, which is what R actually stands for in an R group. This could just be like an oxygen radical or something else. Uh, we're just going to keep it to R to simplify it. This can abstract a proton from this OH of BHT. This creates an oxygen radical, and you can draw that as a radical in the para or the ortho positions, because the para position is more accessible. This is uh, where the radical will usually lie. This can terminate another radical in solution, uh, usually an oxygen-derived radical, rather than forming dimers of itself. And then this will trap a total of two oxygen containing radicals. And so a little bit of BHT really prevents the chain reaction from building up a significant quantity of peroxides. And because it's a chain reaction, if you could stop it early, it will prevent this from happening to too great of an extent. And if you ever compare solvents that have stabilizers to ones without, you'll see why it's so effective. Now you, you definitely want to have uh, 
inhibitors in larger quantities of stuff because this could get worse and worse, especially if you're using it on a regular basis. Most solvents that you buy contain inhibitors, but it's important to check whether or not they do. So there's four different classes of peroxide forming chemicals. Class A are the really terrifying ones that you really have to be careful with. Class B are ones that when you concentrate, such as by rotovaping, concentrating, um, etc., will form dangerous levels of peroxide. Class C would be ones that are like monomers that are uh, very sensitive. And class D would be ones that are able to form peroxides, but maybe they don't fall into any of the other categories too well. So class A, these things can spontaneously decompose and become explosive just by being exposed to air without you even doing anything. Um, it's worth testing these after three months once you've opened the bottle. And some of these include potassium metal, diisopropyl ether, and sodium amide. These are the common ones. Potassium metal is probably the most common amongst these. However, some departments still will have old bottles of diisopropyl ether around, which can be a real hazard. So some, there are some less common ones that I'm not going to go through specifically, but you can see them here. And there's some other links at the end of the video, which you can go to to see other examples. So if we look at class B, these are the ones that you have to do something before they become explosive. You have to concentrate them because the peroxide levels are really low. They don't form them that quickly and they won't just detonate usually. So if, if you concentrate these such as like on a rotovap or if you distill stuff, uh, evaporate it just slowly, the concentration increases and this becomes a hazard. So some common ones include acetaldehyde, benzyl alcohol, 2-butanol, cyclohexanol, cyclohexene, dicyclopentadiene, diglime, diethyl ether, 1,4-dioxane, glime, furan, isopentanol, 1-phenylethanol, 2-phenylethanol, THF, and vinyl ethers. So in general, what these things tend to have is either like a vinyl group, which can easily react with radicals to create more radicals, or just a very weak CH, such as 1-alpha to an ether, um, or something related to that. So there's some other uncommon ones, but I'm not going to go through all these here. And it's always worth checking on a reagent what the possible safety hazards are. So if something's a peroxide former, it's useful to know that, especially if you're going to be working with it for several months. Now, class C tend to be monomers. Unless you're working in a polymer lab, you probably don't work with these too much. And these tend to be heat or shock sensitive because once they get started, the polymerization can just start going on its own. A lot of these monomers are really reactive, as you'll know, like acrylonitrile is used as crazy glue. You know how it is with crazy glue. If you open it at all, it will like be rock solid the next time you use it almost 100% of the time. Um, and this is also an issue with methacrylates and derivatives, styrene, etc. So there's some other ones here, but these are more obscure. You might occasionally in you might occasionally see an acrylate or an acrylic acid derivative in Synthesis, same with styrene, but these ones tend to be more obscure down here. So class D, uh, th these ones usually have had some instance where they formed peroxide, so it's got written down somewhere, but they don't, they aren't common enough to be like as much of a concern to most people most of the time. So for these, once they've been open, you should test them every three months or so. Uh, some common ones include acrolein, allyl ethers, any ether with alpha protons at all, terbutyl methyl ether. Someone in the comment section of a video was talking about how they actually form peroxides in there and they weren't sure how. It's worth looking at that methyl group of terp-butyl methyl ether because there's three CHs, which are still weak CH bonds. Diethyl fumarate, which is a Michael acceptor. Acetals, which are still like an ether, but they still have a CH. 2-methyl-THF, uh, 1-pentene, and THP. Um, there's many other ones, but I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, what I did want to include was this, uh, this story from Journal of Chemical Education from the 1960s, where essentially they had a 20-year-old bottle of isopropyl ether, diisopropyl ether, and they saw some crystals in it. So they did the natural thing you do with an old bottle. They dump the liquid down the drain. That's not very 2022. They then add water to it, but the solid didn't dissolve. And so they left the water in the bottle and they put it aside for disposal. Uh, in a couple weeks, they took it to the dump, they brought it really far out, and they threw rocks at it, and it made a massive explosion that sent dirt and mud everywhere. And fortunately, nobody got injured, but this stuff is, like, really dangerous. And we recently had, at our institution, a 15-year-old bottle of diisopropyl ether found, and it was, like, a big safety ordeal to get sorted out. So diisopropyl ether especially is a really sketchy one that you don't even commonly see used in most syntheses anymore. And it's understandable why if it's this dangerous of a peroxide former. So uh, here's some of the references I used for making this video. There's I'll put these down in the description. There's also some good reading material if you want to see other instances of peroxide issues. This last one was the, the one I just talked about. And I hope that this has been a really useful video for teaching you about peroxide formation and how to deal with it appropriately. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below, and it would really help this channel if you wanted to support us on Patreon. I hope you have a great day.